Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, for the millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Far from Washington, Americans are getting it done. That's uh, close to the headline the Wall Street Journal proclaimed. They said, far from Washington, Americans are finding local solutions. National politics may be paralyzed by partisanship, but states, cities, and ordinary citizens are coming together to get things done. And that's what's the focus of today's show for us. We're going to look at uh, what is happening, what's being done at the local level where the federal government has failed us. Then there's the second segment of the show where we're going to look at kind of where local is failing or where they're struggling, right? Things we're asking them to do, maybe like vaccine distribution that's not going so well. Uh, and why? What's what's causing that breakdown? Why is a a system of localized government uh, bad? And then uh, in the final segment, we'll kind of look at that balance. Where are we at, right? There's a lot to talk about. And the reality is this affects all of us because as we know, Your zip code is a better predictor of your longevity, uh, at least currently, than a lot of medical indicators are. But of course, we couldn't begin a conversation on getting out of Washington and uh, looking at local government without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years. Here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Well, this is one where I struggle because obviously I think there are many things that local governments do much better, but I also see there are aspects and issues where we need federal guidance. And so uh, hopefully we can work some of this out and um, find some solutions here that I haven't thought of. But as far as word of the day, uh, we have our first hyphenated word, pell-mell, P-E-L-L hyphen M-E-L-L. And It kind of goes right along today. It works as an adverb, an adjective, and a noun. But basically, it means in a confused, rushed, or disorderly manner. And I think that kind of describes very well our issue (laughs) concerning local, Uh state, and federal government and how they intertwine and work together as well as working independently. That's kind of what we have for today's episode. <laughs> that is that is kind of what we have. And that's, I think, Lance, this goes back to, we, we say it a lot. I, we, I don't know if we always take time to break it down for folks, but I mean, when our nation was founded and you asked somebody where they were from, right? Like, um, you know, that was the question. Most people's answer, if, if, if you were uh, a foreigner, right? And you were asking an American, you know, where are they from? The answer would not be America. It would be, uh, you know, uh, I'm from Ohio, right? Or I, or I'm from Mississippi, uh, whatever state you were from. That was your, and in fact, when you go back and read some of founding, our founding fathers, uh, documents, they would even refer to that as their country. You know, we think about the European Union being this collection of countries that are operating under a form of centralized government to streamline things. R- really, that model, uh, predating the European Union, obviously, by a few hundred years, uh, is the United States of America, which is this idea that we had these independent states that centralized and created you know, some, some commonalities to pull resources for certain causes. And of course, over time, I think we've seen as we federalized more and more, right? We've seen a transition to, we look at ourselves as a country and these are our state slash local based governments. Uh, but really, uh, we are a union of multiple states or of, of individual um, you know, lands. So, I, and this is highlighted when we're in the midst of a pandemic, when Washington is paralyzed. This is when these things really start to show because we see how all these different states do things. But in this first bit, we're talking, Lance, right, about some of the things that these places where the local government said, hey, you know, Washington's not doing anything, but here's what we're going to do. What uh, what was some of the stuff that stuck out to you here as far as, you know, this is a long article. There's a lot of examples. What were some of the ones that you think people would be uh, interested in? Well, there was one from and, and first of all, this is just an evolutionary process, right? Uh, you start a country and you're like, well, we've got it all worked out. No, it's it's it's, you know a process and we're, we're still working on it and the ebb and flow is there. But there was one, um, in the city in Kansas city with the summer issues towards police 
brutality or police issues. In Kansas City, you had to have your complaint. If you had a complaint towards a public official, towards a police officer, you had to have it notarized before it got into the system. And the mayor and the city council said, well, that's silly. If you have a complaint, you should be able to go on the website and make your complaint. And we can determine whether we look into it or not. So they took out the fact that it has to be notarized. So, you know, there's just something very simple. Just change that rule. And all of a sudden, then you can make it easier for people to voice their displeasure with the situation. There was another one where ability to bring broadband uh, internet service to laid off workers. They could do that locally. They had a company there that they went to and they said, yes, we can make this happen in our local area. Uh, the biggest one I think that I read was in the textile industries in the Carolinas, this l- local medical center was having trouble with gowns and, and masks and people went to the local textile companies and said, Hey, can you switch over your machines and make us what we need? Because we can't get it from the federal government. And the local companies said, great, that's wonderful. So, I mean, you know, those are some little things, but also some very big things that if you have those resources at your disposal at the local level, you can be very effective at getting some things done. Well, and all of those deal with things that I think are in the national spotlight, right? Uh, race, access to internet work slash working from home uh, and COVID, right? I mean, those are, these are all things. It's not like these are specific. Yes, obviously. And this is part of that local government side. Yes, they are unique in those areas, but they're things that we're all thinking about or things that we've all heard about or that we ourselves are facing. Um, and, you know, these are places where these local people, right, said, we're not going to wait around for Washington to, come up with some solution that may or may not work for us, we're going to get together and and make the change happen. They're saying, and, and again, this speaks to the power of that local government, we don't have to wait for change, we'll just make change. And, uh, and that is one of the benefits, right, of local government. And that's the power of it, right, Lance? I mean, that's, that's part of why it's a good thing. Well, you're not talking about moving as many people or switching their minds or getting something done and you can go directly to the people that can have it done. You know, if you need like that, like we were talking about with that textile industry, you can go right to the owners of those two or three companies and you talk to two or three people. You're not talking to thousands that you might have to do with the federal government. You only have to try to get two or three people going and not a whole, a whole bunch. We've obviously got a new presidential administration on the way in. But one of the the interesting things, and this is we'll have to see how this plays out, right, is uh, the federal government is going to be very close to evenly split along uh, Republican and Democratic lines. Now, this this often means one of two things. It either means uh, more paralysis to come. Right. Or it could very well mean an opening of the middle ground. When it's more evenly divided like this, it tends to favor those people in the middle ground that are willing to to compromise and work together, where when you have a majority, it tends to favor your your fringes a little bit more. Um, so I think that's interesting too, because when we see local government accelerate, a lot of times at the local level, Lance, they don't have the uh you know the convenience of being able to be fringy or standoffish, right? I mean, they, it's, it's kind of a lot of times local government just has to get it done. If we're at a city council meeting, right. And we're discussing whether or not to renew the, you know, uh, contract for picking up city recycling. Um, it's kind of one of those, we have to do something, right? We don't have the luxury of Congress and basically just say, well, we're just not going to do anything. So there is a little bit difference too in that structure. That's a benefit of local is a lot of times it's, it's, yeah, you technically don't have to do anything, but in reality, you're going to do something because you can't wait around and and just, you know, off you skate and, and send it down the road. Yeah, it's exactly what I, you took the words out of my mouth, said you can't push it down the road at the local level because too many people have your phone number and know where you live. You just run into people more often if you're a local official and your feet are held to the fire to get things done. Whereas at the federal level, we always talk about contact your congressman, but we're not right there in their face. We can't be, you know, and so it's really difficult to make them feel uncomfortable, but you most definitely can make a local, local officials feel uncomfortable because you see them everywhere. That's not to say there aren't some drawbacks for local governments. There are some things that they can't get done. And 
Uh, we're going to address some of those in the next segment. So yeah, there are a lot of positives for local, but there are also some things where they need some help with. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about coming up. We've looked kind of at, you know, what are local governments doing right now, specific examples, but also kind of how do, how do they excel in general? And what we're going to discuss coming up is in the midst of COVID, right? Uh, and, and now the vaccine distribution, where are local governments failing? Uh, how is it hurting you? And, and also the discussion, uh, you know, more broadly about where where are local governments not so good right where where are the areas that we should not ask them to try to take everything on we've got all of that and more to talk about coming up keep it here on the state of us and we'll be right back we are the state of us here's your host justin t weller Probably 30 years ago, decentralization was kind of a right-wing view, says Mr. Putman, who, along with uh, Mr. Garrett, is the author of a new book, The Upswing, which explores how the nation's social and communal fabric has frayed over the decades and how it might be restored. In the 1960s, segregationists battled the federal government by invoking states' rights to fend off efforts to integrate schools and other institutions, while liberals embraced centralized power as a way to force reform. Mr. Putman says there's been a change in that view on the left. Increasing numbers of people on the left also think that decentralization would be a good idea. That's all from the Wall Street Journal article that's linked at thestateofus.org. You can read it for yourself, but it's kind of the, the foundation or the opening to what we're talking about today. Um, and, and that really, Lance, I think speaks to the heart of it, which is the pell-mell of this situation, right? The, the interesting dynamic of the local governments and the, and the federal government, where they're good and where they're bad. And, you know, when I read that piece, it made me think about when you and I were discussing the COVID relief bill, right? Because we talked about, isn't it kind of funny that, in uh, COVID-19 relief, the Democrats are now the ones that are really pushing for that assistance for state and local governments. And the Republicans are actually the ones that were kind of on the other side saying, well, maybe, you know, maybe not. Um, because traditionally, if you asked people, you know, where, where you would think uh, each side would come down on, it probably would be the opposite of that. But really, we've seen this and kind of Georgia right now, the Georgia election, right? Senate election is kind of this interesting case study of localizing is is not something that's so party specific anymore, right? But now we've got this negative side about why is that bad, Lance? I mean, what we run into some issues, right? When we say, well, we want to take on the issue of racial injustice or police reform, and we're only going to do it at the local level. Some of these issues, and I'm not so sure about police reform, um, I, that it, this falls under that, but with especially with the COVID relief bill, sometimes it takes resources and money that locals don't have to get things implemented or to get things done. And that's why and you have to look. Right. And that's why you have to look towards the federal government for that support. And that's where you see the Democrats saying, um, we need to give them the money so that they can take their ideas and run with it. Because every community, every region of the country has different needs and they have different needs at different times. And so to pigeonhole money, I mean, there are numerous examples in the last 30 or 40 years of government funding that goes unused because a state or a local region doesn't have a need in that area. So we, we saw back in the seventies, Nixon, you know, doing more of block grants saying, okay, we're going to give you this money. You use it as you see fit because you, the local, know best what you need to do. Another problem has to do with if you live in a local area that has money and resources for the problem that you're facing, you can get things done. If you don't have the money or the resources, you don't have the people, you don't have um, the educational base, you don't have whatever the issue is. If you don't have those people and those entities at your disposal, you can't be effective and you need help from the outside to help get that done. I think one of the issues with the COVID relief bill and those things is that we had President Trump 
who at times seemed to say, well, I'm going to help these people, but not these people, and made it a political issue. And then that made it really tough to get everybody behind doing something for the positive. Um, and it, it, it made that partisanship even worse. And I think what you said earlier is true. We'll either still see some of that partisanship or with both the House and the Senate being close now to get anything done, we're going to have to see some bipartisanship. And I think that's where we're going to head is we're going to see Democrats and Republicans starting to work together because it's going to have to happen to get anything done. The vaccine distribution is a good example of an area where we're not seeing local government succeed because when you look at a country uh, like the United Kingdom, uh, where you have a, you know, federalized uh, health system, um, the distribution process is very different, right? They can decide we're going to send people out to these areas. Here's the single sign up process the whole nation uses. And, and from a communication standpoint, they have the resources of a federal government to get the word out, right? Because, for example, the prime minister can go on TV and 70%, 80% of UK citizens are probably going to see or hear about some part of that appearance within a few days. If the, you know, uh, governor of Ohio goes on TV, you know, 30, 40% of Ohioans maybe are really going to be up to speed on what he's saying. And that's just, again, it's not just TV, it's social media and, and, you know, the the president, for example, is going to have millions and millions of followers, the governor of a state, maybe not so much. So there's a lot of things there that aren't just about the coordination of it, but also about the ability to communicate it to your country as a whole to get the word out um, and where you can and you can streamline those processes. Because part of the problem is we talk about all this vaccine distribution stuff in our country, but the federal government is not really able to say, well, this is who's going to get it and when, because they, they can say this is what we're recommending, but it's up to Ohio or Florida or New York or California or wherever to decide how and who is going to get it when and what process they're going to And follow. we're seeing that play out, right? And in front of our eyes is that the federal government has done the job to go out and uh, get the doses you know, and, and to sign contracts with the different drug companies and the pharmaceutical companies to bring the doses in. But then we see where California has this set of rules. Ohio has this set of rules. Florida is going to do it this way. And so while that's a great thing for you at the local level to be able to try to solve that problem um, because the government's gone out and gotten you the doses, we're seeing that Local governments, state governments don't have the capabilities, don't have the infrastructure at hand to deal with, well, how do I get rid of my 50,000 doses that I have? How do I use them? And, okay, now I have this plan. Okay, but how do I implement it? I don't have the resources available. I don't have the medical personnel available. I don't have the space available. And so now I have these doses that the federal government got for me and we're grateful for them but we can't find a way to get the shots in the arms in an efficient manner because we don't have the infrastructure in our local or state level. And that's not only where we see other countries that we would regard as democracies, but particularly, right, because we we harp on China and Russia, sure, a lot, because communist nations with generally what most of us would probably regard as dictatorial regimes, um, they they have – a upper hand here, right? Because one, um, I actually, we'd have to check. I, I'm pretty sure that it's still, um, you know, a voluntary in those countries, quote unquote, voluntary to get, to get vaccinated, but they could make it compulsory, right? And if they did, uh, even without making it compulsory, their effectiveness and ability to basically roll it out and distribute it and require different industries to do it and all this sort of stuff, it's far greater. Now, but that is a trade-off, and I think this is important for people to understand. Freedom comes at a price, right? We are we are living one of those costs of the freedom that we say we care about right now. You want 50 states, you want 
thousands of local small towns and counties. This is what you get when there is a pandemic where you need a strong centralized federal government to put it down. You don't have it, you know, because that's not that's not how we operate. And that's one of those trade offs. Um, you know, arguably, we they do not experience as much direct democracy in the United Kingdom as you do in the United States. That's just the reality. You know, uh, the process of selecting a prime minister uh, is different than selecting a president. Um, so I, I I just think that's important to highlight too, Lance. Right as we as we prepare to talk about the balance and the back and forth, and that's not to say that what's going on is good because I think we can do better and we should strive to do better without saying we have to give up freedom uh, or we have to give up our health. There's probably a way to do better inside of the system that we have. We're just we have failed to to nail it down. There may be a better way. But it's not necessarily you're going to have to give up one to get the other. And that's why, you know, we need to get people to let us know what they feel about this. You know, get a hold of us at the state of us and let us know because what is that middle ground? Because anything that I give up power or control to the central government is freedom that I lose. And so it is a balancing act. And what are we willing to give up? Because it is cultural, right? Because if the Chinese government, says, this is what we think you ought to do. Well, because of the culture and the mindset of the Chinese people, they do what the government says. In the United States, our history is, well, the government said to do this. Um, okay, these are the questions I have. Should I do this or not? Skepticism. Do this? And, and it's, well, but that's cultural. You know what I'm saying? That's, it's, it's in the way that we do business. So it's not a bad thing. It's just, my point is it's different because of the way people are, are brought up, the way they are reared in their country as to what they do when the federal power says something, when the national power says something. So it's that give and take, like you said, and I don't know if we really can do a better job and keep everything that we have. And that's what we're going to look at coming up is that balance. But as Lance pointed out, we want to hear from you. What do you think about our conversation so far? Email podcast at the state of us.org podcast at the state of us.org. That's our email. Uh, send us your comments, your questions. Uh, we actually have uh, another uh, comment to share from a listener in the third segment of today's show. Uh, another one that clearly listened to all three segments of the show, uh, which we always appreciate if you if you're able to make it till the end. Uh, sometimes the best stuff is uh, is in the last bit. So we're going to look at this obsession with national politics. Would we be better off if we focused a little bit more on local? Those questions and the answers to them, more to come on The State of Us. Keep it here, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. I don't even know what it means to encourage people to act locally, says the conservative writer Rod Dreyer, who lives in Louisiana. I talk to people on the left and the right. They are all obsessed with national politics. I fear we are losing what it takes to make those local connections. Now, we've talked about so far, right, the stuff that local governments are doing well, the places that they're struggling what should that balance be? Are we happy with the balance we have? I think Lance and I have talked a lot about, um, and we really pushed in 2020, you should show up to the polls. And I, and I think we have this backwards. Most Americans go vote to vote for president. Most Americans should go vote to vote for their local politicians. And while they're there, they should vote for the other stuff. And that's part of why we see part of what perfectly illustrates this discrepancy is the turnout for presidential elections, uh, presidential election years is so substantially higher, often by double and sometimes closer to triple uh, what it is in local off election years. Um, And I, Lance and I lived through that when I was running for local office. Um, Turnout was one of the hardest things uh, to combat because people are not taught, uh, I don't think, that their ability to affect change is the greatest at the local level. And it's a simple math equation, uh, you know, keeping it scientific for our 
uh, producer. It's uh, if I am one of 40,000 people and I go to vote, statistically speaking, my vote makes a much bigger difference if I am one of 8 million people or if I am one of 320 million people. I just gave you, by the way, Champaign County, Ohio, state of Ohio, and the United States of America, right? My one in 40,000 is far stronger than my one of 320 million. I mean, we can do the, you know, what percentage of the total am I, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, there's a lot of decimals there for the one of 320 million. I can tell you that. So, um, and I think that's the point that we're, that we're talking about, right? Lance is this concept of, um, you, you are always going to have the ability to have more say and more swing, generally speaking, at the local level than you are at the federal level. It's just the nature of you're closer to those people. Like you said, you're going to run into them. And that's a good thing, but we don't view it that way, do we? I mean, most Americans, I'm not talking about you and me, but I think a lot of people out there, they're, they're so following the, the national stuff. And it's like, yeah, but at the end of the day, you're going to notice if your trash doesn't get picked up or if your water gets cut off. But in their defense, you get you get wrapped up in your day to day life, and you don't pay attention to what's happening locally until something like that happens, until your trash doesn't get picked up, or your water is turned off, or you want to get a vaccine, and all of a sudden you don't even know how to sign up for it because there is nothing available by your local government to do that, and that's where we live in this seesaw effect or what I call the pendulum effect where we go back and forth. It's like, well, get the federal government out of my life. Doggone it. Just let me take care of myself and I'm going to be fine. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not fine and my local government can't handle it. So now I need the federal government to come in and, and help me take care of this. And that's where we live in this back and forth world where We crave one thing and then we realize that we can't take care of all of those things for ourselves. So then we reach out for help from a bigger entity. And therein lies that evolution that I was talking about earlier in the episode where some of us want that help more often than others. And so then we have to figure out, okay, what are we willing to accept? What freedoms are we willing to give up? in order for that federal government to come in, that federal entity to come in and solve this problem for us. Because our independence comes from doing things at the local level. But people don't see that because it's like, well, I don't have to do anything until things aren't working well. And then I have to do something. Instead of looking at it, it's time to do something, make things better. Well, things aren't too bad, so what can I really do to make it better? I mean, I don't have a problem. When you have a problem, oh, now I'll get involved. And I think we see that on the national level more than people take the time to see it at the local level to answer your question. But I think it's this back and forth that we go through as a society as I don't want the federal government involved. Oh, my gosh, this problem's so big. We need the federal government. And it's that push pull or that pendulum swinging back and forth where we say we need more federal government. We need less federal government. And it's that cultural evolution that, that takes place in our country. I, I, I do want to mention because I think it articulates for people, in my mind, part of the challenge that local governments face is this issue with communication. It's one that we talked about uh, in, in my campaign heavily, but this is not a this is not an issue that's unique to our municipality. There are cities doing it better than Urbana. I'm not sure that I've encountered any cities where I would say they're doing a good job. They're doing a better job, right? That's like that whole, uh, are, are local governments really doing a good job uh, where the federal government's doing a bad job? Uh, they're doing a better job, right? Uh, and my point there is the federal level, and part of why we're all so obsessed with it is what I talked about before. We all have greater access to the information about it. We're not as aware of what's happening locally. And there's a lot of things that contribute to that, right? There's the media landscape, the mainstream news, um, and and the dying of local press. I mean, all these things go into it that, that are outside of our control. But what is within our control and what we, I think, have to start doing is 
making sure our local leaders know that we expect communication to get better because we can re we can reshape that dynamic of thinking about, well, I go to vote because I'm voting for the president. And while I'm there, I'm voting for the local stuff. No, no other way around. It should be the other way around, I think. And and we want to know what you think at home. You can email us podcast at the state of us.org. But that's what I think. I think that's what Lance thinks, because, again, you can really make a difference at the local level. And if your local government doesn't want to do it, you can probably even step up and and make it better all on your own. You know, you can get a few people together and you can do some stuff that might even make a difference um, even without your local government if you have to. The power at the local level has a big ability to have the most power over your life. We do not know that as a nation. And I think we've lost some of that where we really, we did start more that way. Right. I mean, if you look back at history, that's kind of what we opened the show and talked about is people used to kind of look at it more that way. And why? Because from a communication standpoint, it was really hard to learn about what was happening uh, five or six states away. You had the most of your news was local news. That's what you learned about because that's what was available. So but now it's switched and it favors the national the national information over the local. But that's the evolution that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, a, a movie that I like to, sh- to watch uh, called Sergeant York about Alvin York, who was a World War I hero for the country. But he lived in Tennessee. And when the local peddler came through, he started talking about the United States going to war in Europe. And none of the people in the hills of Tennessee where Alvin York lived knew what he was talking about. You know, is that... We didn't get news like that, you know, because there wasn't social media. So, you know, you're thinking, and yes, that was a hundred years ago, but that was, you know, part of that evolution that I'm talking about. Now we have access to that information and it makes us more in tune with what's going on nationally. But then I would just end with this. And that is we have so many more opportunities to your point to make a difference at the local level. We vote for a president once every four years. We vote for a senator once every six years. We vote for a member of the House of Representatives every other year. But every few months, we have an election at the local level where we're voting on the school board. We're voting on um, a budget for the, the, the elder center, or we're voting on library funds, or we're voting on street repair, or we're voting for city council, or we're voting for county commissioners. We do that on a monthly, not not monthly basis, but, you know, twice a year. We have elections where we have the opportunity. And then there are also special elections. So we can also have it up to four times a year. So where is our voice more powerful? Not just in the numbers, like you said, Justin, but in the opportunities to have our voice heard are much greater at the local level than they are at the national level. We just have more opportunities to have a voice, which is huge, which is what I think drives the importance of voting in local elections and local issues. Uh, My favorite part of the conversation was your example with, I believe, uh, some distant parts of Tennessee, right, Uh, where they had no idea what was going on at the sort of more federal level, but at the local level, that's what they really cared about because that's all I knew. And the big question I think this episode asks is how how can we spark interest and excitement about local issues again? Because this is something that I also experience. Like I don't I don't know much of what's going on in my, you know, my hometown or my county, but uh, just because of the nature of how media is, I I do I do have an idea of what's going on, you know, at the federal level with the election and everything else going on. I would honestly consider myself someone who would be interested in you know getting involved. Like when I found out all the things I can get involved with at the library, that's something I took action on. I'm sure uh, there's more folks out there like myself who, if knew that these things existed, they would uh, ultimately get involved. And that's why you and I, I think, both feel. We have not, I don't think we've lost the balance of local and federal yet. We're maybe kind of on one of these tipping points. The good news is we have the opportunity, to Lance's point, we have an evolving country. We're constantly changing, right? Constantly going through, we're constantly in motion. We have to be conscious and decide to uh, unplug and and pull back and and not get quite so obsessed at only the national level. 
I think it's great that we're seeing more engagement, Lance. I mean, you and I have talked about it feels like forever. Um, I mean, probably since 2011 when we started the show, uh, we've been talking about, you know, we want to see engagement higher. Well, you're seeing engagement higher. And I'm amazed at the people who would not consider themselves um, you know, political junkies who are who are seeing things about the election, who are talking about the Georgia Senate races, right? These things that even just five years ago, I would not have heard these people talking about this stuff. I think that we have to make sure that we communicate to people that you got to bring that at the local level. But again, we want to know what you think. You can email us podcast at the state of us dot org. I want to share this comment from Brian. He sent this through and uh, and it's and it's super long. I've read the whole thing now. Lance is is reading it as well. But this last bit, I think, stuck out. It's a good way to end our conversation today. Brian says, ultimately, it benefits society to have every person's productive ability maximized. Every young person should have the opportunity available to them to reach their full potential without taking on crippling debt. Perhaps the simplest solution across the board is to offer competition to the current forms of subsidized state education. The generation before mine had ample opportunities. My generation could do so with only minor debt. That's not a viable option for most people anymore. We need to rethink this. And I think that's at the heart of what we do, right, is trying to rethink stuff, talk about things. Um, and, and, and open up the opportunity for the discourse because we don't have to agree with everything that everybody says. That's not what we're about here. We're not trying to get everybody to agree. We're trying to get everybody to find some common ground to move forward with. Well, you said the key word that you said earlier was communication. And that's what we started this show for is to communicate to people, to talk about issues that aren't on the national radar in the major media markets and to get people to converse and have these conversations because we feel that this is where the real change takes place. And so to that end, we at True Chat have a mission, and that is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And so this is, that's right up our alley. We're not, as you said, we don't try to change people's minds. We try to talk about an issue and then get the conversation going because that's where good change will take place. That's where positive change can take place. And then we can all live a better life. And that's what we're all about here at True Chat. So if you like the show and you're talking to your friends and they say, well, where can I listen to this show that, that you're listening to and, and we're talking about? Well, you know, you can go to Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. Remember that you'll have an opportunity for us to share what you think. Uh, Lance and I will review it, maybe talk about it a little bit. You can email us, podcast at thestateofus.org, comments and questions. Please send them along. The State of Us is a podcast released by on Tuesdays and Thursdays by 4 a.m. Eastern Time. We're also a syndicated radio program heard on AM and FM talk stations throughout the country. So check your local market, see if we're carried. If we're not, call them up and tell them they should. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our recording and editing producer for this episode, Bradley Butch. Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.